I know that it appears that I am unprepared this morning. I am prepared, actually. I'm just prepared for a different event. I have a little speech all prepared to explain to Elijah that it's hard to get people to come to meetings nowadays, and so that's the reason why it's me and Kathy and him in the room, and, and uh, the whole thing was all prepared and ready to go. Ed actually called me yesterday to see if I wanted him to set up tables and chairs down here, and I said, great man of faith that I am. No, we won't be meeting down here. So I am thrilled that you are all here. And uh, once again, Warren Craker has proved right over my, uh, my estimations of people's willingness. So uh, I want to uh, just say a quick word of prayer and then turn it over uh, to Elijah Vandelar, who is Dan Vandelar's son and also Shauna Vandelar's son, who you may have noticed in the, uh, in the uh, gray side this week. Got her uh, in there, and I will be making a further announcement upstairs again this morning. <laughs> Apologies, Shauna, for leaving her out of the equation last week. <laughs> uh, come on up, Elijah, and uh, we'll say a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for our hunger and thirst uh, for your word. I just pray that it would grow and spread, and you would bless uh, Elijah and uh, his ministry and this class as well. And we give you the praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm recording this, so I'm going to make an effort to repeat questions if I'm asked questions. Just so you know, today's going to be a bit of an introduction. We're not going to actually start going through the text a whole lot. We're going to flip around a bunch and look at things, but we're not going to start actually going through the book of Genesis. I want to start with a few opening comments. This isn't going to be a sermon. If you keep coming, you'll notice I'm not a very sermony person. Uh, basically, the difference is, in a sermon, there's this unspoken rule that you don't raise your que- hand and ask questions. I don't know who made up that rule, but that rule does not exist here. So if you have questions, feel free. Ask them. I like it that way. I think that's how they did it in the early church. Nowadays, we have the uh, podium set up at the front, and I stand here. In the early church, it was more like a circle, or a rectangle, actually, the way the synagogues were set up. And that's why in Corinthians it says... You can't have a woman speak in church. Now you wouldn't need to say that because nobody speaks in church. (laughs) Nobody. (laughs) So that, anyway, I'm going to make an effort to be somewhat comprehensive as we go through the book of Genesis. I'm not going to be exhaustive. I'm not going to tell you everything I know. I'm certainly not going to tell you everything that you could know, but I'm going to make an effort to cover the major themes and to cover the major issues So we're going to take more time as we go through creation because there's a few major issues there. And we'll take more time as we go through Abraham and Joseph because they're major emphasis of the book. Uh, But to make that happen, I'm going to skip some things. So for the sake of those of you who are here for the whole thing, I will try to cover enough of the major stuff that you feel like you've got a grasp of the whole thing. For that reason, today's going to be introduction, because there's some things that if you don't know them, it's as if, it's like you learn a language, but you don't know the alphabet, you just kind of look silly. So there's a few things we're going to cover today that are like that. They're basic, you've got to know them to, um, before you can say, oh yeah, I took a class on this, and then people are like, oh yeah, well, what about this then? And if you don't know the answer to like, what does Genesis mean? People are going to think, you didn't take the class. And I'm going to give you just a uh, warning, and it's more of a plea, actually. I just came back from teaching uh, two semesters of Greek exegesis, and I have a bad habit of, like, going way over people's heads. I do not do it on purpose. I spent a lot of time praying that this time would be beneficial and uplifting for all of us, that I would only say words that administer grace to the hearers. Um, But I and myself, the spirit gives life and the flesh is no help at all. I am just an obstacle in the way of God helping you to learn something that will actually benefit you in life. So if you see me getting in the way, my plea with you is that you would have patience with me. And if you're extra spiritual, that you would pull me aside later and say, hey, uh, you started rambling in Hebrew, like, cut it out. (laughs) Something like that. All right. First thing to say about Genesis. Genesis is a book of what I would call the Torah or the law. You see this in, uh, let's turn to Romans 3 real quick. 
I'm going to be flipping everywhere. If you didn't bring your Bible to a Bible class, uh, that's, that's on you. Speaking of, I'm going to assume some familiarity with the Bible. I would hope most of you have read through it once. Like if I talk about a story and say Joseph did this, that you're not going to be learning. You didn't, you know, Joseph went to Egypt? I didn't know. I hope that's not you. I'm going to assume some knowledge so that I can explain the meaning of things. So, I would recommend, if you want to get the most out of this time, that in the next month or two or three, you read Genesis and Exodus on your own. Because Exodus and Genesis are going to be jumping all over all the time as though you know what I'm talking about. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, then it might not be my fault if you're not following Usually it will be, but in that instance, if you forget that Moses was in Egypt, then it's not my fault. I will not take responsibility for that. Okay, uh, Romans 3, really quick. Very end of Romans 3. Notice he says, uh, verse 31, Do we overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. And the chapter numbers are not part of the original inspired text. And he immediately goes on and says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Notice that connection. He's talking about the law. He he wants to prove that we uphold the law. And he starts talking about Abraham. Turn again uh, also to Galatians 3. You'll see the same thing. It's a very simple point, but I hope you, you get it. Galatians 4, sorry. It says, You then... Who desire to be under the law. Do you not read the law? Which verse is that? Good question. I hadn't found the page yet. 21. You who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written, and then he's presumably going to quote the law, that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. He's talking about Ishmael and Isaac. These are things in Genesis, and Paul says he's talking about the law. There's sometimes in the Bible when law refers specifically to what Moses gave at Sinai. In Joshua chapter 8, it says they write down the book of the law on a stone. Now, they managed to do it in a single day, and it doesn't seem to have taken all day, which to me implies they did not write Genesis through Deuteronomy. I've tried writing it out. I don't get far. I will spend hours. I'll be a few chapters in. I'll spend all day writing it out. It's like three, four chapters maybe. What they got, that's the law that came at Sinai. The law that came down the mountain on the tablets. Um, the law that was in the instruction for the people. But it's not the whole book. Other times, like here, law is used to refer to the whole book. Jesus came to fulfill the law and prophets. Everything Moses said. So, anyway, all that to say, Genesis is part of the law. So we're going to talk a bit about the law today. Then we're going to introduce Genesis specifically. So I want to start with, why is the law significant? Uh, Turn to Deuteronomy 34. Within the Old Testament, the law holds a special place. It's, um, It's put at the beginning in every version of the Bible that we know. If you go to the Greek, Syriac... Latin, whatever. Every, we don't know of any version of the Bible where the first five books aren't the first five. And they're always the same order. If you were to go to Hebrew, some, some books aren't the same order. Like, uh, they put Ruth right after Proverbs. So that when you read Proverbs 31 about the wonderful woman, you read about Ruth immediately after. They do it on purpose. But these five books are always in the same order. So, Deuteronomy 34. It says... Verse 10, there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to his servants, to all his land, for all the mighty power and all the great deeds that Moses did in all the sight of Israel. I don't know exactly when that line was written. Uh, The way it's written when it says, None since that, no one has risen since in Israel, implies it's written at a time when they're in Israel. Uh, It implies that there have been other prophets that have arisen, and none of them were like Moses. You could say this right up till Jesus came. Until Jesus came, there was no prophet like Moses. Nobody did miracles like Moses. 
Nobody spoke face to face with God like Moses. Isaiah sees visions. Ezekiel sees that wonderful vision of God riding in on a chariot and all that. But nobody goes up on a mountain and talks to God like a friend. Only Moses does that. And so it gives his revelation a special place in the, in the Bible itself. All of the other prophets, when they want to tell Israel what to do, almost always they're quoting from Moses. And they're reminding Israel of what Moses said. They'll put it in different words, but they never tell them something new. Like, Moses said, love the Lord. And they don't add anything to that. Nobody adds anything to that until Jesus comes. And suddenly, love the Lord implies a lot more. It means pick up your cross. That's new. But there's nothing new until then. Nobody came with miracles. John deliberately takes this passage to show that Jesus is greater. You know how John starts in the beginning? was the word. He's going back to the beginning of Torah. And then when John ends, he ends and says that nobody, you couldn't fill the book, you could fill the world with books of miracles that Jesus did. He begins like Torah, he ends like Torah to say that Jesus is better than Moses. But until then, Moses was foundation. Turn to Psalm 1. If you have questions, like, just stop me. Sometimes I'll say, any questions? And I'll just move on like you didn't have questions. Another bad habit. Psalm 1, probably written by David. And David says in verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Talking about a man who's blessed. Someone whose delight is in the law of the Lord. This is true of David. David's delight was in the law of the Lord. He's called a man after God's own heart. I want you to stop and think, how much of the law was actually relevant for David? If you go to the first five books, how much of it are laws that David is supposed to follow? On the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. No, not there. Probably not start there. You should build an ark of gopher wood. No, David doesn't have to do that. Uh, Up, go from the land of your forefathers into the country I will show you. No, David's already there. But you go through all of Genesis, no laws. Um, Even you have full chapters in Exodus, from Exodus... uh, about 22, there's a little break in the middle, but all the way to the end of the book, practically, is laws. First, about how to build the tabernacle. Well, David doesn't have to build the tabernacle. They already built it. And laws about how to move a tabernacle. Well, it's already where it's going to be. And then explains how they built the tabernacle. Oh, those laws were outdated by the time they were written down. No, you ever think about that? The law tells you how to build a tabernacle. You can only do it this way. But by the time it's written down, it's written down alongside, and they did it that way. So that the law is actually relevant to nobody. The law includes laws for manna. You only pick up the manna six days a week, and on the seventh day, uh, on the sixth day, you'll get double manna, and you'll pick up double, and on the seventh day, you'll eat that, and you won't go out together. Well, as soon as they got to the land, they didn't eat manna anymore. So huge portions of the law are you could argue, irrelevant for David. And yet he says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. I want to push this same concept a little further. Go to Psalm 119. Uh, Question for you guys. I don't want to be the only one talking. Who, uh, at what time was the book of Psalms compiled? There's Psalms from different times, right? Psalm 90 was written by Moses, but... Some other songs were written by David. So at some point, these were all put into a book. When was that? Anybody know? No? If you look at Psalm uh, 137, just quickly, you'll get an idea of when it was. Psalm 137 starts out, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Look at verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? The book of Psalms was put down and sung. These were, this is a collection of songs that Israel loved to sing at a time when they were in Babylon. How much of the law do you think was relevant to the people in Babylon? How much of Leviticus? They don't have a temple. God gave them all these laws about how to offer a sacrifice. You come to Jerusalem three times a year. What Jerusalem? There is no Jerusalem. And you offer your sacrifice. We don't have sacrifices. We're in Babylon. 
Go to the temple. There's no temple. So all of Genesis doesn't have laws for them. All of Leviticus doesn't really have laws for them. Most of Exodus, all they really have, it's like they can't even keep the Sabbath a lot of the time because they don't control their lives. It's not their country. They don't get to make the rules. You know, if you're, you might want a seven day work or seven day week, but if you're, if you're not the boss of your life, it's hard to do that. And yet, these people who could not follow most of the laws put Psalm 119 in their book. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. And it is a praise of the law all the way through. There's one line in Psalm 119. I'll just kind of quote from it all at random. Because you can go through the whole thing. The whole thing's about the law. Like verse 47 says, I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. And they loved them in Babylon. Even though most of them were just a reminder of all the blessings they didn't have. And look at 48. I will lift my hands toward your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. Lifting up your hands in the ancient world is the idea of prayer. You see that in 1 Timothy 2. Paul wants all the people in all the different churches raising up their hands in prayer. Usually, every other time they lift up their hands towards something, it's to where God is. I lift up my hands towards Zion. Why? Well, that's where the temple is. That's where God is. That's where I pray towards. The psalmist says, I lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love. The commandments is where you find God. Even in exile, when most of the law was absolutely irrelevant, the people understood. I don't know my time here. I don't see a time on here. 920. Thank you. The people understood that they could go to the law and find joy. The law would give wisdom to the simple. The law would teach them who God was. Law is uh, almost an unfortunate translation in sometimes. Sometimes the word law really does mean law. Like the law about this, the law about that, the law about sacrifices. There are laws. They're very legal. But in English, the word law is always legal. In Hebrew, this is why I call it Torah. It's actually HaTorah. But the word Torah doesn't actually mean legal every single time. It's instruction, teaching. In Proverbs, it's used like this. Uh, My son, do not... Do not reject my teaching. Do not forsake your mother's Torah. It's not talking about your mother's law. It's not making your mother a legalist. The idea is your mother taught you well. She gave you her teaching. And God says in Exodus 4, Israel is my firstborn son. And he gives them his teaching at Sinai. And he leads them through the wilderness and he disciplines them as a father disciplines his son. Now, for us as Christians, we're not under the law. But you know, most of Israel wasn't under most of the laws for most of their history. And so when they say that they find their delight in the law, I want to suggest that there's no reason that you wouldn't also find your delight in the law. I want to look at how the New Testament refers to the law and just ask yourself, do they think it's outdated, useless? I don't think you'll find that. Look at, uh, let's say, Romans 15. Just go to a few places. Romans 15, verse 8. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to um, get rid of and make outdated. Uh, No. To confirm, that, that means to make certain, the promises given to the patriarchs. Jesus' is coming made the promises more certain. I mean, they're already certain. They're God's promises, but they demonstrate God's commitment. You see the exact same thing in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll go there as well. If I'm flipping too fast, um, you can. I will read the parts that I think were, are relevant to what I'm saying here. 2 Peter chapter 1. He says in verse um, 19, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. 
to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He doesn't say the prophetic word is outdated. He says we have it more fully confirmed. Now that Jesus has come, now that we've seen his glory, the Old Testament doesn't become outdated. It becomes more precious. David looked at the law and he said, this is my delight. And he didn't even know it was about Jesus. So how much more will it be our delight now that we see in it, God hid a mystery for the ages, Christ in you, the hope of glory, hidden. No one could see it. But now it's revealed. All right, enough about that. We'll move on a little bit. Just want to define Torah briefly, we did. Most people, when, uh, if they were teaching you on this, they probably refer to it as the Pentateuch. That's fine. Pentateuch means uh, five boxes. Penta, five, tuk, box. The reason was every box would have a scroll in it, and each scroll would be one of the books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Usually, in, in a Jewish Bible, the Torah would end, and they'd say, thus ends the five fifth parts of the fifths, or something like that. And you'd get the idea that this is one comprehensive whole. I like Torah because it's the, it's the word that the Bible uses. The Bible refers to the Torah as either the uh, Torah Adonai or the Torah Moshe, the law of the Lord or the law of Moses. They'll use them interchangeably pretty much. Jesus seems to accept these titles. Look at Matthew uh, 8. At some times, Jesus will treat the law as having come from Moses. Matthew 8, verse uh, 4, I believe. Unless I get there and it's not verse 4. Yeah, he says, See that you say nothing to anyone talking to this fellow he's just cleaned. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. So he's referring to a law and he says, Moses commanded. Because it's the law of Moses. In Matthew 22, verse 31, I love this verse. If you ever want to understand how the Bible understands its own inspiration, this is my favorite verse for that. I'm in the wrong chapter. <laughs> 22, 31. As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? Think about that. What was said to you by God. He doesn't say what was said to those guys back then by God. He says it was what was said to you by God. So on the one hand, Jesus is, um, assumes and understands that the law was given by Moses. What Moses commanded to them. On the other hand, God speaks to you. This is 1,400 years later after Moses commanded, and Jesus quotes it and says, what well, God commanded you. Have you not read what God said to you? So it's the law of Moses. It's the law of the Lord. If it's the law of Moses, that doesn't necessarily mean that Moses wrote every single word. Like that line we just read, um, a prophet has not arisen since in Israel like Moses. I don't think Moses wrote that. There are Jewish rabbis who think he did to say that there will never be a prophet like Moses. It's their way of getting around Jesus. They say, Moses wrote that to disprove Jesus. I don't think so. I think somebody else wrote that Moses died. And um, a few other lines throughout the Torah are like, um, and the Canaanites were in the land at that time. Probably not written at a time when they were. So there's stuff like that throughout where it's like, Moses didn't have to write every word for it to be the law of Moses. Jesus didn't have to write all of Matthew for it to be authentically, I can quote Jesus from Matthew and say Jesus said. I don't have to say Matthew said Jesus said, because Matthew did a good job. <laughs> Whoever compiled the Torah in the end did a good job, and Jesus accepted it. So that's good enough for me. I don't want to go beyond it and try to say Moses had to write every word. You know, he uses place names that didn't exist in his time period. Yeah, I don't have to say that. It's enough for me to say it's authoritative from Moses, it's authoritative from God, and Jesus confirmed both. I'm going to move now to the, uh, if you're taking notes and trying to follow me with headings, now your heading would be the message of the Torah. 
In English, the names of the books of the Torah are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those names uh, don't come from the Bible. They come from, I mean, they come from your Bibles, but they were added in later. The English is from the Latin, which is from the Greek, which was kind of made up at some point. Um, not exactly sure when, maybe 100 BC, maybe a little later. Those names are, they can be helpful. Like Exodus. Exodus means exit. That's why they, they look the same. I was looking for an exit sign. There's one. It doesn't say exit on it. But, you know, exit, exodus. Because they exit uh, Egypt. It's helpful, but it's not a, it doesn't give you, like, a key to the book. In Hebrew, they title the books based on the first word. And often books do this. They'll give you a, pri- a primary sentence. So you'll put your thesis at the beginning of a book. We do this in the New Testament with Revelation. Uh, revelation is the first word in Revelation, and it tells you about the book. This book is a revelation. God revealed it to his servant, and that introduces everything in the book. If you keep that in mind as you read, it'll help you. So in Hebrew, uh, the titles are Bereshit, Dele Shemot, Vayekra, Vamidbar, and Eli Devarim. In the beginning, these are the names, is Exodus. Leviticus is anti-called. I think the Jews get um, numbers wrong. They say it's in the wilderness, which isn't the first word. The first word would be anti-spoke, which does help you because what you say, by your words you're condemned, by your words you are justified. If you keep that in mind as you read, that's the whole book. What does Israel speak? Israel speaks against God and they're condemned. There's two out of the uh, 12 spies, right? 10 are bad and two are good. You might know that song. There's two that speak a good word, and God commends them. They get to go into the land. There's ten that speak a bad word, and God speaks against them. The whole book's about speaking. If you just go through and think about speaking, it'll help you with the book. It's a book about apostles. You'll find the same thing. You go through Hebrews, building on numbers. Spoke is important throughout the whole thing. Um, And Deuteronomy, these are the words. So I'm going to go through those again. In the beginning, Genesis, these are the names. Exodus. If you look at the uh, names of the sons, you know, that's how it starts. These are the names, and then it gives you the 12 tribes and Joseph. All of those names are prophetic and tell you about the Exodus itself. Issachar's uh, wages. And here's some bizarre concepts of wages. Israel is given their wages. They were slaves. Slaves don't get wages, but they're paid to go out. Moses' mother is paid wages. The word Issachar actually shows up. Paid wages to nurse her own son. There's uh, Dan, it's judge. Who made you a judge over us? Joseph is Ad, uh, Ephraim, fruitful. And they were fruitful and multiplied. We won't go through that today, but suffice to say that the titles of the books in Hebrew give you keys to go through the book. Bereshit, sorry, in the beginning, and Genesis basically do mean the same thing. Genesis, uh, genesis, is the word for uh, generations or origin, which basically means the same as beginning, which is helpful because pretty much every doctrine in the Bible can be traced back to Genesis. Everything starts there. The gospel was preached to Abraham. It was hidden, but it's there. There's not something in the Bible. If any major doctrine even minor doctrine, that you're not going to be able to find it starts in Genesis. It's the beginning of Israel's history. It's the beginning of God's work with them. In the beginning, these are the names. Andy called, Andy spoke. These are the words. Do you notice something in common with these? I'm going to skip in the beginning for now, but these are the names. Andy called, Andy spoke. These are the words. There's uh, speaking involved in all of these. God is a God who speaks. That shows up in every book over and over and over and over. Leviticus is the centerpiece of the book. That's common in uh, Hebrew literature. They'll put the most important thing in the middle. And it has more than any other book. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying. Over and over and over and over in the center you have God speaking. Which you need... Because faith comes through hearing. How could you believe in a God who's invisible if he didn't speak? The Torah from start to finish is a book about faith. 
Faith in an invisible God who speaks. Because they didn't see any image when they were at Sinai. They didn't see anything. They heard. For the rest of our time, and let me see how much time that is. Oh, man. I should bring a clock in here if we're going to be in here in the future because my clock is not showing up. I will try and get my glasses replaced. (laughs) I'm going blind. That's okay. I'm going to spend the rest of our time talking about how Genesis is a book that encourages faith, that guides you in faith. Um, Let's look at one more verse in the New Testament before we start that. Just uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's say I start in 14, actually. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, that would be God, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are now irrelevant, no, wait, sorry, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He's talking about the Torah, talking about the Old Testament. It's able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God. Have you not read what God said to you? And profitable for teaching. That's Torah means teaching. For reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I want to spend the rest of our time here today just looking at how Genesis is a book that encourages faith. Right from the beginning, you learn that without faith... You can't know anything about God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How do you know that? Were you there? No, he hadn't created man yet. Nobody was there. Well, how do you know? God said so. You can't see it. Faith isn't believing something with no evidence, as some atheists would have us believe. But it is believing in something you can't see. You can't see God. You can't see the creation. But we believe it because we trust God. The book ends, if you will. Genesis starts and ends, each with one man. One man who doesn't show faith at the beginning, and one man who does show faith at the end. I'm going to pause there for a second. Uh, The Torah is Middle Eastern literature. It's rather different than the way we would write anything give you an example. We would use different English words to capture the exact nuance of what we want to say. Look at uh, Genesis 2, verse 7. It says, He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And in chapter 3, at the end, in verse 19, it says, By the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread. See, the translators are being very English. In Hebrew, nostrils and brow are both nose. They have a different sense of how to communicate. We want to use the exact word for the exact situation. They want to use the same word in both situations to tell you to make to, to compare them. So that you see that Adam was created to work the ground and he was cursed. It would be hard for you to work the ground. You were created a living being. Now you're you will return to dust. Eve was created because it was not good for man to be alone. But now, we'll compare it. It's going to be hard for you to multiply the opposite of alone. They're created to rule the beast who tried to rule them and now you'll be on the ground lower than everybody. They use words to make uh, comparisons between things, which I bring up now as we talk about Adam and Joseph at the beginning and the end of the book to say these things are deliberately written in such a way to cause you to compare them. One is a man who was given everything in the garden, except one thing. One is a man who was given everything in Potiphar's house, except one thing. And one says, one lives by sight. Eve saw that the fruit was good. But Joseph doesn't. 
One listens to the voice of the woman. One doesn't. One flees temptation. One, by unbelief, a lack of faith, brings death to the whole world. One, by faith, by trusting God, by having a faith that even leads to love. Remember in chapter 50, Joseph says, what, God, what you purpose for evil, God purposed for good. He so believes that God is in control that it leads him to love. One, by his faith, preserves life. In all the earth. In Hebrew, that's the same phrase. Adam brought death to the whole world, kol ha'aretz, and Joseph preserved life in kol ha'aretz, all the land. Doesn't mean the whole world, but that's how it's worded. All the land. So that you see that faith is in what you can't see. But sometimes what you see makes faith very difficult. And you see that faith leads to blessing. For many, Abraham believed. It was counted to him as righteousness, and he was made a blessing to all nations. Joseph believed. He was made a blessing to all nations. Adam didn't believe, and he was made a curse. And he was cursed. And everybody is cursed now because of Adam. I want to focus, narrow in now on uh, Walking by faith and not by sight. You'll see as you go through the Torah that often what you see is misleading. Eve saw that the fruit was good. And it was misleading. There was a garment that was bloodied, torn. Are you going to believe in this garment or are you going to believe in Joseph's dreams? Jacob. Jacob stored up the word in his heart when he heard the dream from Joseph. But when he saw the garment bloodied, he believed that for years and years. There was another garment. Potiphar shouldn't have trusted it. But he saw the garment and he trusted that. Sometimes God wants it to your life to look different than what it He doesn't want it to look like he's trustworthy. Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him to me as a sacrifice on the mountain that I will show you. What does that look like? It looks like God is going to have him kill his son. It looks like his son is going to be dead. He believes his son's dead in three days. God knows that. God has set him up to think that his son will be dead in three days to see if he will have faith even when everything looks wrong. Will you walk by what it looks like? Or will you walk by what I said? Through Isaac, your offspring will be named. Will you walk by faith, or will you walk by sight? Abraham walked by faith. Israel offered the same thing. They, they, uh, it looks like their sons are going to die. They're going to fight giants. They're huge. God says, I'm giving you the land. Will you walk by faith? Will you walk by sight? Faith in what I said? Faith in what you heard? Faith that comes through here? Or what you see? Giants. Or at least the uh, 12 guys saw them. You're going to believe them or you're going to believe me? Even uh, someone like Isaac. Isaac's going blind, right? And you would think a blind guy would be smart enough not to walk by sight. But he'll walk by anything but, like, uh, but by, uh, by hearing. You know, he hears the sound. You sure sound like Jacob. Are you really Esau? Well, I can't go by what I hear. I've got to go by what I, uh, I can't see. What do I smell? What do I feel? What, is, what does it seem like is going on? I don't want to live by hearing. So over and over as you go through Torah, and Genesis especially, you see that you're given, you can walk by faith or you can walk by sight. And you've given these examples because God's giving you illustrations to show you. If you walk by sight, you're, you may stumble. Sometimes what you see is not reality. Sometimes what you see is very misleading. You see giants. You see garments. You see a fruit that looks good. You see... I think this happens to all of us at times. You, you look around and you think, 
God can't love me. If he did, my life would look different. God knows that. God knows what it looks like. When Jesus is dying on the cross, do you think it looks like God loves him? I mean, that everyone else is looking at it going, we, we called it. God hates you. Clearly, you're on a cross. I mean, this is what God's hatred looks like. And they're right. That's what God's hatred looks like. Jesus is taking the wrath of God. But Jesus perfectly walked by faith, not sight. Sometimes, when... I'm going to stop in a few minutes here so you have time between now and then. Sometimes, it's very easy to walk by faith, or easier. When things are very difficult, it's harder. Adam should be able to walk by faith. I mean, you know, the devil says to God, Job only believes you. He only follows you because you give him everything he wants. Adam's given everything he wants. I mean, if there was a guy who had reason to trust God, it's like Adam was created by God. He, the whole world was created and basically given to Adam as a gift. He has everything he wants. God creates a wife specifically for him. I mean, I, you know, if there are soulmates, that's it. God makes one for you. God tells him, you can have anything. I'm giving you dominion. But not this one thing. Adam doesn't believe. Joseph, on the other hand, has everything taken from him. See, one is given rule and dominion and has it taken away for unbelief. One has everything taken away, but believes anyway and is exalted and given dominion. Do you see that? Jesus wasn't in a garden when the serpent came to him. He was in the wilderness. God didn't tell Jesus, you may eat from all anything. Jesus hadn't eaten in 40 days. He wasn't feasting at night. He just hadn't eaten. He was with the beasts, it says, in one account, including serpents. And yet, when Jesus is tempted, unlike Adam, he is faithful. Adam sins when everything looks right. Jesus obeys even though everything looks wrong. That's the kind of faith God is calling you and I to. To have a faith that believes in what God has said, regardless of how our life may look. A faith that is able to pick up our cross and follow him. A faith that's willing to die with him. And like Joseph, If we die with him, it says we will also reign with him. I'm going to pray for us. Uh, I hope as we go through this uh, book of Genesis together, you'll be given a lot of reasons to trust God. As you see over and over that he planned your salvation in Christ Jesus from the very beginning. Faith comes through hearing, and I hope that as we go through, you'll see that more and more. Today, I just wanted to introduce a few things, that this is a book about faith. It's a book of the Torah that is given for our instruction. But I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, you go do whatever you want for 10 minutes. Lord God, thank you that you have given us your word. Lord, thank you that you have not simply called us to a faith that, um, and given us no reason to trust you, but that you have proven time and time again, your trustworthiness. Lord, I thank you that you have given us Jesus, who had a perfect faith, who showed us what faith looked like, who showed us your character. Lord, I ask that you would conform us to the image of your Son, that you would move us from one degree of glory to another as we gaze at him. Lord, help us to see him today in the sermon, as we go out from here, that we would meditate on who he is, that we would be filled with joy Not as the world finds joy, but joy that comes from you. Joy that's the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, fill us today with your Spirit. Help us to honor you in all that we say. Help us to build one another up as joints in the body that are working properly. Building one another up in love. Lord, pour out your love into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.